Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the third panel discussion on, which is on crop protection, crop protection and food safety. I think I think with the main focus on crop protection because that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, there are, to my mind, quite a few issues facing not only the crop protection sector but those who use crop protection products to produce food, those of us who eat food and want to think and be involved and have an interest in the role that crop protection products may have in not only in creating yield but also any potential environmental or indeed health effect that they might have through residues and whatever. Now, I come at this really starting with the thought of the most recent European Parliament elections, which produced what people called the Green Wave. And the new Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, is talking very much about the new European Green Deal. And it feels very much as though there's a world in which, firstly, consumers are going to be expressing environmental concerns, but also over the last few years that consumers have lost an awful lot of trust in large corporate organisations. Um, and it is fundamentally, and I'll resist, try to resist preempting Sarah, but one of the problems is it is very expensive to produce crop protection products, and so they are in general produced by large corporate organisations. So we, one of my lines scrubbed out. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have this, we have this issue is how do we go forward? How do we, how do we feed the population of the planet? while preserving, I mean, not only satisfying people's environmental fears, but satisfying genuine environmental requirements. Um, and with that, I think I'll get Sarah Mukherjee, who is the chief executive of the Crop Protection Association, which is the prof professional body for the industry in the UK, to tell me how the Crop protection sector sees it. Kick it off. I, I'm afraid it's a bit more random than that because yeah. I've got a kind of general yes. thought, a uh, tour d'horizon, because uh, I know that Chris um, is the expert and he'll do all the expert stuff. There we go. No pressure, Chris. Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, good morning, uh, everyone. No, good afternoon. Just good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. What I thought was it has been a fascinating series of panel discussions. And thank you very much to the Brazilian Embassy for your hospitality and your uh, presence of mind and thought to, to have this event. Uh, now, I, uh, although I'm very, very old, I'm doing a part-time MBA. Um, and this is actually, this is a bit, I'm using this as a therapy session, frankly, because, you know, I am, uh, I'm far too old for all-night essay crises, and I'm far too old for essay deadlines. But here we are, and one of my electives is complexity theory, and I know all the MBAs amongst us will go, oh, God, complexity theory. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really interesting and novel way of looking at a very fast-changing world. And I think uh, one of the points I'd like to make is how the disruption that we've seen in lots of other sectors, I think, is on its way to agriculture. I think it's probably been on its way to Brazilian agriculture, and it's coming probably to Europe as well. That could be good disruption in terms of IT, of R&D, of robotics, of big data, but also there will be inevitably, I think, a disruption in terms of the, the cultural diversity, if you like, of the agricultural sector. Um, because we know in complexity theory that diversity is a key strategic component of resilient systems. Now, um, you know, I will be honest, I used to be the BBC's environment correspondent and rural affairs correspondent, and often I was the only brown woman in a room, um, often, and it hasn't changed dramatically, I'll be honest, there is more to do, although there is great hope, I think, for the future in the UK. Um, one of my uh, voluntary roles is I'm a director of the Oxford Farming Conference, which is our like one of our festivals of ideas uh, in the agricultural year. And I uh, coordinate the Emerging Leaders Programme. So we find young farmers, mid-career, um, who are going to be the leaders of the future, we think. And I have to say, I have been overwhelmed by the quality and the, the, the 
um, the involvement, the enthusiasm, and yes, the diversity of this year's group of leaders. I'm really excited and, and honoured to lead them. Um, but uh, it's not just diversity of social and cultural norms. We also need to think about diversity of farming. Now, not a lot of people know this, as Michael Kane would say, um, but we don't just provide synthetic chemistry, traditional pesticides, but a lot of our members also are very involved in biopesticides and also for inputs for organic farming. And that diversity, I think, in the UK is a really strong thing. Conservation agriculture, organic farming, sustainable intensification, low-till, min-till is all really important. We have a lot to learn from each other and it makes me really um, inspired when I see farmers, and there are a lot of them in the UK, who don't see conventional or organic or low-till or min-till, whatever it is, they don't see themselves as that sort of farmer. They see themselves as a custodian of their land and they farm in the most appropriate way possible for whatever their land needs and requires. And that is brilliant. And also uh, the NFU and ourselves, we are involved in a collaborative program called the Voluntary Initiative. And the aim is to, uh, to pr promote good stewardship practice and best practice amongst farmers in the UK, making sure that uh, chemicals stay where they should be uh, and not go into the watercourse and, uh, and out uh, into the wider environment. And we've just started a program uh, with what we call VI Champions. So these are farmers, they're agronomists, and they, their job, if you like, they do it a couple of days a year, <coughs> is to go to those farmers' meetings and to talk about that best practice. And that peer-to-peer that -peer learning, I think, is the way that we, we, get, um, we, we get the message across. But, and we've heard a lot about them today, we can't ignore the population pressures, the productivity pressures. Um, we've heard an amazing story of Brazil's productivity change, the step change. We struggle with productivity in the EU, and I think it's going to be an increasing uh, problem for the future. And um, one of the issues, and I think Chris has alluded to it, is um, what could be a politicisation of a scientifically rigorous regulation process. Um, we think it's really disappointing when um, when a very, very complex process, it takes a quarter of a billion euros in 10 years to get a product to market, a pesticide to market in, in Europe, when that is felled by a Twitter campaign or felled by a perceived democratic deficit. The science should not be trumped by popular feeling. And I get um, Chris's point about uh, consumers being very concerned. Yes, they are, but also the consumers um, who are on limited incomes are really concerned as well. I mean, we talk a lot about food in the UK. Oh, my goodness, don't we talk about food. Bake Off, MasterChef, millions of people watch this. Um, and, you know, the, the, the BBC nearly had a riot when it decided to, to take down its popular recipe site. Does anybody remember that? Oh, my God, six million people, you know, complained. And... I have to say, I have been one of those people who've gone to it when you're looking at five things in the fridge and wondering how to make, a, make out of them. The BBC website is brilliant for that. And, you know, they were my former employers, but I promise you I don't get a, I don't get a royalty fee for telling you that. But it is. It's a marvellous site. But the reality is that we have six million people in food poverty in this country and we have four million people um, using food banks. Now, that, I think, is a national tragedy but we cannot get away from the fact that for most people, it's not a five, you know, three-star Michelin restaurant or you know, amazing things to do with Turbot or MasterChef that drives people. It's price. Now, I don't want you to get the violins out for me, but I grew up in a council estate in Essex. And money, you know, we weren't poor by any stretch of the imagination, but money did not flow, and neither did the food. I know about food deserts because I lived in one. You know, there were places where you don't get the best fruit and vegetables, you don't get the best quality. And for me, price is one of those things that we very rarely talk about in the UK when we talk about this issue. We talk about lots of other things, but not the fact that there are people for whom they have this much or this much at the end of the week in terms of their income, and that depends on whether, essentially, they get to eat or they don't. And 
price needs to be talked about in terms of the overall context of food supply. Um, I was a single parent for a few years, and I can tell you, you know, I don't, it's not nice to be food shamed by rich, affluent people on the television telling me I should spend £20 on a chicken. You know, if you know the kids are going to eat fish fingers, frozen vegetables, there won't be any raised, they'll eat it all, and you'll have a bit left over at the end of the week. That is a powerful incentive. Um, and I know I don't want to carry on talking too much, but we did a little bit of research for... Uh, we got Sean Rickard, the former chief economist of the NFU, to do some research for us. And we found that for the average family and the average basket of shopping, um, it would in, the, the costs would increase by nearly £800 a year without crop protection. And for many people, that would be the difference between making sure the kids have a new pair of shoes for the beginning of term or, or even uh, being able to eat well as a family and not. Um, there's always more to do. There is always more that we can do and we should do as an industry. There is always more to talk about in terms of environmental impact. And I do think the future is bright, should we get the right science and technology. And I, I'm <coughs> sure Chris will talk a little bit about that and gene editing and other technologies we don't have in the, in the European Union at the moment. But we must never forget the ultimate consumer. And the ultimate consumer needs food, They'll need food in a growing and increasingly you know, demanding uh, global food system. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, science and technology has to have a place in that and will be part of the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I turn to Chris Hartfield, who's Senior Regulatory Affairs Advisor. For some reason, I can't hold that phrase in my head for more than three and a half seconds. And I've kept looking at it all the way through. At, at the NFU, which stands for National Farmers Union, in a case anybody, anybody doesn't realise that, and which makes you the expert from the farming industry in how we see regulatory affairs in crop protection. You're having, Apparently so. You're having, a, you're having a complicated life. I would suggest to you for a start that even though there is just the off chance that at some stage in the next few years part of Britain might leave the EU, that given the weight of the EU and EU policy, you are stuck with it and you are going to be influenced by what is the European consumers. Yeah and the Brussels regulators' view of how we carry on farming. Now, in terms of how does the, how does the farming sector feel about this, and you know, how are we developing the thinking with crop protection? Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, I think I'll probably come on to the Brexit. No one's yeah. mentioned it. No, yeah. Yeah. So, Brexit free zone so far. No, no. <laughs> I thought I was going to be the first. No, I will touch, on, I will touch <laughs> on that later. Um, but firstly, thank you to the, uh, the um, MC of Brazil for inviting us to this panel today. Um, I think we've already heard a lot really about those kind of big global challenges uh, mm. we're facing in food production. And I think we've also touched on some of the new technology, kind of the reasons to be optimistic actually. Uh, the new technology that might be coming down the line, we're apparently on the cusp of the fourth era of innovation. So, you know, there are some reasons to be optimistic. But I think one of the greatest challenges facing farmers in the area of crop protection can be really summed up by the phrase, mind the gap. And I think our concern is whether these food and crop production businesses will actually be able to sustain themselves long enough to be able to realise these new technologies. Will they be around long enough to actually take these new technologies on board? And I say this because some of the specific challenges we're facing in the UK are really, they are really quite acute. Um, we've mentioned the kind of EU regulatory system, a system that we see as being overly precautionary. It's a hazard-based uh, pesticide regime, and that's resulting in the progressive loss of uh, crop protection products. But more than that, it's also stifling opportunities to bring new technology to the marketplace, new more effective, lower risk alternatives. We're facing, I mean, it's a global issue, but we're facing increasing levels of resistance by pests to those tools that we do have available still. In the UK, we've got something called the 25 year um, environmental plan, a, a you know, big plan from government. And that's challenging us as an industry 
to put integrated pest management at the core of everything we do, at the core of a holistic approach uh, to protecting crops, with, as it puts it, with the minimum use of pesticides. And we've also got other challenges in the, in the wake of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of controversy in Europe around neonicotinoids, and, and in the wake of that, um, there are those that are asking for something called pesticide vigilance. This is basically once a pesticide or crop protection product is, goes through that really expensive regulatory process that we talked about, then actually we start looking, once it's out there in the hands of farmers, we start looking for post-approval, do post-approval monitoring to look for landscape scale environmental impacts. So that's another challenge that we need to think, you know, how do we tackle this, how do we move on? And we've also got organisations, uh, NGOs, that are calling for um, pesticide taxes and pesticide hard pesticide reduction targets. And they're looking to get these actually put into UK regulation. So there's a, a lot of challenges there. And as an organisation, the NFU, we've been thinking about, well, how do we meet these? And for the past year or more, um, we've been working on a new um, plant health strategy, which tries to tackle um, some of these um, issues. And we've been having discussions, not just with our members, our farmers, and what they're looking for, but also with other organisations outside the EU and with people in government as well. So the strategy, it sets a clear long-term plan of proactive action. Um, we want to lead improvement in the area of, of plant health for farmers and growers. It's all about optimising the use of the solutions that we have and driving that innovation to actually get some new and better and more sustainable um, solutions. So it's about developing a sustainable plant health solutions that enable, really put our members, farmers and growers, in a position where they can produce crops that, that meet the demands of the consumers, that meet the demands of the environment, but also that enable them to run profitable farming businesses. Because ultimately, if we want farming to be green, we want farming to be environmentally minded and do environmentally good things, first and foremost, they need to be profitable in order to be able to do that. Um, there are five main strands of work to this. And I'll briefly go through those. The first is around availability of solutions, and it's really kind of mapping what solutions are out there. Um, we want solutions that are effective and that enable <coughs> improvements in, in productivity that we've already talked about. And it's about understanding where the gaps are and filling those gaps. Often when we lose a pesticide, um, there's, there can be an impression given that actually an alternative is there that can just be switched on tomorrow. You don't need to use this particular pesticide. This is about having a bit more of a kind of honest conversation about that. Is, is that actually the case? It may well be that it is the case. It may be the solution's actually 12 months off and needs a bit more market development before it comes along. It may be that it still needs R&D and it's three years off. It may be that it's a, a classic piece of breeding work and it's actually 10 years off. So we need to be better at, at mapping those gaps and more strategic about filling them. The next strand of work is all about putting IPM, integrated pest management, at the core of everything that we do. And our aim is we want to put in place a, a common, um, IPM approach that is basically doing much better recording the IPM that we are doing and that we can use to demonstrate that all of those decisions around crop protection are, are taken with this, within this kind of IPM matrix, this IPM decision tree. So that ultimately if we do have to get to the point where we have to intervene with you know, a classical bit of kind of pesticide chemistry, you know, we can fully justify that that is being used as the tool of last resort. The next strand's around agronomic advice, and that's going to be very key uh, to delivering this. Um, and we want to get all agronomic advice basically based as a, a very much an IPM-based service. So it's going to help um, farmers deliver on those uh, commitments. We also need to look at a change in relationship between agronomists and farmers. We're moving out of an era where uh, an agronomist could prescribe a solution to a pest problem. And it would pretty much give, you know, 110% control. And, and that wouldn't be a problem. Now, we're moving to a more systems-based approach where there could be lots of different controls, lots of different strategies involved. And it could be that that doesn't work in every year. Maybe it fails one year in five. And then there's a cost impact of that. And there's a burden there. And there's a discussion to be had about how that risk is balanced. There's a piece of work about transparency. We need to be more transparent about our use of pesticides. Um, 
we see that transparency is going to happen regardless, I think, uh, of whether or not we get involved. So I think we, that's why we do need to get involved. And there's probably we're going to see greater transparency. We've talked a lot about it today, transparency and, and traceability. I think it's going to happen with all food inputs. So this really focuses on getting the recording of all pesticide use, which is, is currently a legal requirement within the UK. We need to get that on a national database that we can make better use of to build government and public trust, and also to look at things like optimising um, pesticide use. Alongside that, we need better measures of pesticide use. We've got quite crude measures at the moment. We talk about <coughs> amount of active ingredient we put on. We talk about the amount of hectares we've sprayed. Actually, what we need to understand and know about is the impact. We need to have better measures for impact because that is really what we are looking to reduce. And the last strand's on regulation. And basically, we need support from government. This is a two-way street, so we need that support coming back from government to underpin R&D, that, that they've got a holistic um, policy framework um, as we exit the EU, delivering safer and more effective and lower-risk pesticides. There might be options for government to incentivise agri-environment measures that help us deliver those IPM activities. Uh, and we probably need government support for better, um, better metrics that I've already mentioned. So finally then, just to touch on Brexit, you know, I think there is a big problem with the EU regime. Um, it's in its ninth year, the EU pesticides regime, and in that time, it's only delivered 20 new active ingredients and put those in the hands of farmers. And you know, this includes things that are, are more effective, that are lower risk, that are safer. And I think that's pretty uh, much a failure and shows that it's stifling innovation and it's stifling bringing those new technologies um, forward. And it, it makes it really difficult for us to control pests and diseases. Brexit, hopefully, should enable us to do things better, um, have a more pragmatic, a very much a very rigorous science and evidence based <coughs> UK um, regulatory system. And I think as part of that, we'll be able to observe all those existing the same standards of consumer environmental protection that we have at the moment. We'll be able to enable trade, but we'll also be able to do things better for those that are actually trying to grow the crops and control these um, pests. A really simple example of a Brexit opportunity, and it's one that our regulator is quite bullish about, is that it believes it could bring new technology to the marketplace, have a new crop protection solution on the marketplace in less than half the time that it takes the EU regulator to do it, simply through efficiency of that assessment process, doing things in parallel that currently the EU assists doing end to end, and the fact that we won't have to have the discussion with you know, 28, 27 other member states. But you say the big question about Brexit is, you know, when we're we actually going to leave, when will we be able to realise those opportunities? Are we going to leave with a deal? Um, which means we will have a period, a kind of protracted period, where we are very closely aligned uh, with the EU, or are we going to have no deal? In which case there might be opportunities for greater divergence. But I think on top of that, we also need a culture change um, from in government and in politicians, and we need our politicians that are prepared to back a UK um, that is being science and evidence-based in its regulation and its decision-making. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> right, well, um, I can't see from over here. Yes, okay. so I'll move on to Louise Payton, who is Policy Advisor for the Soil Association, which is... Firstly, the largest organic certification body in the UK, but I think has, it's fair to say has a wider remit as, an, as a campaigning organisation leading the organic sector. So, yes, where does the organic sector fit into this? Well, I first of all, should probably say a bit more about the Soil Association. Um, so we are most well known for certifying organic uh, farms and products in the UK and all around the world. Actually, um, so I work in the charity side, and our charity has a really broad remit. So some of us, uh, some people might think of us as the organic charity, um, but I, we're much broader than that. So basically, I've been campaigning now for six years, and it's about connecting the dots between climate change, um, between the health crisis and the wildlife crisis, 
and all the issues that um, farmers face in the UK. Um, and uh, we see organic as part of that picture, but by no means the answer. Um, and it, it gets, it's going back to the idea of diversity in, in the farming sector, it's, it's totally necessary. Um, so we, and we also certify 14.5 million hectares of forests around the world, so it's not just farming, it's also forestry, and joining the dots between forestry and farming. Um, and we do lots and lots and lots on healthy eating, um, and that's a really kind of critical part of what I want to talk about. Um, so we, um, in terms of connecting the dots between different things, we see uh, there being three crises facing farming. So you've got climate change, you've got the wildlife crisis, and you've got the health crisis. And um, when it comes to crop protection, I quite like to take that step back and, and think about the bigger picture because when it comes to how farming has been viewed in previous years, um, that, that bigger picture has kind of been forgotten about and that's uh, resulted in this focus on productivity and on yields um, and on the price of food um, and not on the hidden costs of the farming system. Um, and there was a study done a few years ago looking at these hidden costs and it estimated that um, for every pound that people spend in the UK, 50, uh, the extra 50p um, is effectively charged in hidden costs to that person um, due to the association between the, the foods that we're eating and the, the obesity crisis and the health crisis. And a further 50p um, comes from the impacts from the agricultural um, production system itself. So this is the environmental costs, the cost of climate change. So that's um, effectively, Every time someone spends a pound on UK food, you're actually being charged another pound in hidden costs. Um, and I think that's quite an important thing to think about when you're talking about what is the uh, future for agricultural production, because um, what we see as the answer for the next agricultural revolution is that it's about these wider public values and, um, and dealing with this issue that food is effectively too cheap um, farmers aren't being paid enough and the public aren't getting the full suite of um, public goods that farmers can provide. So, um, going back to crop protection, we have a series of recommendations. And the, the key one is about this, this bigger picture and it's, it's what should this agricultural revolution look like in the future. Um, because of the fact that it is a bigger picture, it, it, the links with... Um, with health is so huge. Um, the two, two statistics I like to lean on to, to show that is um, around nearly 90% of countries in the world have overlapping burdens of obesity and malnutrition. Um, so it's not just about um, lack of food and it's not just about too much food. Those, those issues are occurring at the same time. So it's showing that the food system currently is not, not working. And secondly, um, 60% of the energy that we get from food comes from just three, three crops. Um, so that's wheat, rice, and corn or maize. Um, so those, that, those stats, I think, kind of show that the, the level of problems with the, the food system, it's not just about producing enough food for a growing population, it's about dealing with this health crisis and it's dealing with the fact that we're not eating the right foods and we are reducing the, the number of crops that we're, we are eating. <coughs> Um, so, in terms of um, what the next agricultural revolution should look like, um, it's this idea of an agroecological system. That's, we want to see um, a transition over the next 10 years to, um, to what we call agroecology in farming. Um, and this is, I don't know how many people are familiar with this idea, it's um, supported by, by the FAO and um, it's generally described under 10 principles, and I'm not going to list all 10 of them, um, but there's a, a social side to it, which is all about, it, again, it goes all back to diversity. So this is diversity not just in the farming system and the foods that we grow, but also in our diets. Um, so it's that link. Um, and it's also about uh, making the most of positive synergies in, in farming systems. Uh, the, the most famous example, I don't know how many are familiar with, um, in Asia, there's a system of, of rice paddies where it's bringing in fish and ducks, um, and it creates a system where you, you have much, much less um, chemical inputs. So 
that's a, a kind of well-known uh, textbook example of making the most positive synergies in the farming system. Um, and it, it brings in all these different principles. But from the point of view of crop protection and pesticides, the biggest one is this idea of IPM, which is um, what Chris has referred to. And so for us, when we talk about IPM, I think there's a different, uh, different ideas of what IPM is. But um, we kind of see it as a, when we talk about this transition to these agroecological systems in terms of a transition to IPM, it really is about supporting farmers to start to move away from just relying on pesticides to using more cultural approaches. Um, so that's going all the way from um, at one point, if you like, in the UK at the moment, there is some monitoring done of, of pests and diseases and some forecasting, um, and there is definitely um, an attempt to, to, to try and use less pesticides, so we would argue pesticide use is unfortunately increasing. It's, it's kind of hard to, to look at that because of the data. Um, but to truly uh, adopt IPM, we want to see the government really uh, paying farmers to... to, to move towards this system where your, so for example, your soils are healthier, so your plants are less susceptible to diseases and therefore you can reduce your fungicide use. Um, and in terms of insects, <coughs> it's about increase, promoting your wildlife so that your pests are um, managed by beneficial organisms and therefore, again, using less insecticides. So it's this, it's this um, kind of holistic approach. That doesn't mean to say that we don't think technology can play a part clearly will, and, um, and we're also really excited about lots of the technological advances, but it's not, it's, we see this as, it's not just about technology, and it's not just about replacing pesticides with something else, it's looking at the bigger picture and transforming our farming systems. Um, and going back to pesticides, we have some specific recommendations for the government. So, um, the, the first one is, is this, this idea that we need to introduce measures to UK farmers, to transition to these agroecological systems, and in particular, that's using the new pub public subsidy system, farming subsidy system, sorry, um, to incentivise and reward farmers. Um, it's also about improving the advice available to farmers, um, and um, this is that's actually a, I say that as it just skimming over it, but really that's a massive, massive issue because what we're talking about is a farming system which is really, really complicated. And um, there's a lot, a, a lot to learn, a lot of innovation needed, and new markets are needed because you're talking about diversifying your crops. Um, it, it, so it, it's, it, I, it's by no means a simple thing. Um, and a key part of that is in terms of promoting this innovation and learning. It's, it's, it comes back to farmer, to farmer learning, it comes back to farmer led innovation. And we do a lot of work on that. Um, and then in terms of other recommendations, um, I think Chris, you briefly mentioned that what charities are calling for, and, and we're definitely one of them, which is this, an idea of a pesticide reduction target, um, because targets are a really great way of promoting that innovation and getting farmers to really support, and the government to really support farmers. It's, this is not about vilifying farmers, this is all about supporting farmers. Um, and also we have... Um, a recommendation that the government had, uh, creates this, this, this pesticide vigilance uh, system that Chris also mentioned, which is this post-monitoring system. At the moment, we have very little idea um, how much pesticides um, are really being it affecting wildlife. Um, it's, it's the accumulative effects of pesticides and how they interact, and it's monitoring that um, after they've been authorised. Um, then there are other recommendations that I can, I can go into, but I'll probably stop there because they get, it starts to get a bit detailed. Um, and I, the only other one I wanted to touch on again is, is, is Brexit, and in terms of what many of the uh, NGOs in the UK uh, think about pesticide regulations, and that is that we, we really want to see the level of, the, the, of EU regulations kept, um, and that, that's where uh, there'll probably be bit of discussion potentially um, and as a result um, we basically want to see either EU regulations kept or going beyond them and that's not to say that we don't we're not interested in the idea of a slightly different system um, the idea of moving towards a risk-based system 
is a really interesting one and in principle sounds absolutely fantastic. It's just about whether it's doable. I'm not so sure, personally. Um, and um, in terms of trade deals, it, that's a huge, huge concern for us, particularly if um, even if the latest withdrawal bill goes through, it, it, there's a potential for a, a no-deal situation in the future. Um, and that, that raises all sorts of issues around the, um, the issues of farmers in the UK potentially having to be outcompeted by uh, products being brought in using a wider variety of pesticides um, or the UK lowering its environmental standards. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Right, good. Right, now we have Elena Costa, and I hope I've got that right. And um, we're, we're getting two for one here because not only is this gentleman the chairperson of the Codex Alimentarius Commission, he is also the Brazilian Agricultural Attaché in Brussels, which <laughs> means that we have somebody who can tell us about Codex, and I'm interested to find out at what point, because people have been talking about there being a much more worldwide approach to regulation in issues like crop protection for a long time, and Codex playing a bigger role in it. But also, you're somebody who sees how Brussels works, particularly with Brazil, with a country outside with which it's doing trade negotiations. So that's a, that too is an interesting exercise. So I hand it to you. Are you going to come and stand in front of the screen? I'll stand in front of that screen. Thank, no, I think uh, it's, it's okay from here. Right, thank good. you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Fred Ahuda and the all diplomatic body of, of, of the Embassy of Brazil in London. It's an it's a, it's a honor for me to be here with all of you and also with you, Chris, and uh, my colleagues uh, here trying to exchange views in, in this very important issue, in my point of view. I'm going to try to, to give some information, to exchange some information in terms of uh, what codex is being done in terms of crop protection and, and, and food safety? Well, I think firstly it's, it's important to know that we, our responsibility is to make standards. We need to make standards, we need to make code of practices, we need to make guidelines. And when, when I'm saying that we need, member countries need to do that because this is a member-driven organization, then everything comes from the members. And uh, the strategic importance of the organizations is exactly because it's the most important multilateral organization dealing with food safety and fair practice in food trade. Since 1995, when we have the end of the Uruguay round multilateral negotiation, we have the creation of the World Trade Organization, the agreements, and in the SPS agreement, we have uh, the Codex Alimentarius as the reference for food safety issues, as we have the OIE for animal health and IPPC for plant health. Deck structure. Sometimes it seems to be very complicated, but at, at least to me, the architecture of deck structure is very well thought, you know? We have uh, the Codex Elementaris Commission, which is the part of the structure which adopts these standards. We have the Executive Committee, which has to scrutinize everything which comes from the com technical committees. And we have, in fact, three different uh, uh, kind of uh, committees. We have the general committees, we have the commodity committees, and we have the regional coordinating committees, which we are, for example, this week having uh, one meeting in Santiago uh, of the coordinating committee for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, my friend, vice chair from UK, uh, Steve Ward, is there representing the, the bureau during, during the meeting. And we have, for some specific issues, an ad hoc intergovernmental task force, as we have, for example, now for uh, antimicrobial resistance. And you can see here 
I would like to call your attention. Here we have the pesticides. I don't know if it's working. I think so, yeah. Anyhow, pesticide residues committee uh, in the general committees. One committee specifically dealing with uh, pesticides in, within the codex. This is one picture uh, I had the honor to participate in the uh, 50th, 50th session uh, in China of the Codex Committee on Pesticide Residues. And this committee is, it has a lot of things in its portfolio. For example, uh, the committee has to establish maximum limit residu residues for pesticides for a specific foods or group of foods. Also, if we, we, if we have uh, specific pesticides involved with uh, the feed chain production, also the committee has the responsibility to take into account if the member or a group of members present this demand. This is a very important point, to establish the priority list of pesticides which should be evaluated, scientifically evaluated, we will talk a little bit further on, on this issue, but this is a very key point for the committee. First things first, what is necessary to be done first? Of course, it depends on the members. It depends on the demand of the members or group of members uh, related to a specific substance or a specific commodity, commodities related to a specific pesticides. We have here the, the site that uh, we can uh, uh, find the priority list. Methods of sampling and analysis, a very important point also in the portfolio of the committee related to the pesticide residues. Any other matters that we have related to pesticides and also maximum limits for environment and industrial uh, contaminants, which has some similarity of pesticides. So these, in general terms, uh, is the responsibility that the Codex Committee on Pesticide Residues has. And to do that, it's absolutely essential to, to work with the science. We cannot open hand uh, on science. Uh, I was uh, hearing today many, many uh, examples and uh, exchange of views in terms of uh, different issues related to uh, deforestation, uh, related to uh, some uh, commodity, uh, some commodity, some, some product and, and, and some commodities, different commodities that can influence in this kind of thing. Also for pesticides, for either for these things or for pesticides, we should work with science. And when we are talking about science, we are talking about the FAO, WHO, Joint Meat and Pesticide Residues, which is composed by independent experts from different parts of the world, which takes care of the scientific risk assessment to give to Codex the necessary background, scientific background, to adopt or not one substance. This picture is one meeting that we had of the JNPR, and JNPR has a lot of, uh, I could say, responsibilities. For example, uh, they support the scientific uh, 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 information for Codex decisions. I have heard here also collaboration, uh, some, some examples of part, uh, public and, uh, and private partnership. Collaboration is absolutely essential for the wo work of the JMPR. Uh, the organization counts on information from different sources, from university, for, from research institutions, from member countries, etc. So collaboration is absolutely essential for the work of the International Scientific Advisory Body. And of course, it's very important to have a good team. And this good team is composed by people who is uh, specialized in this kind of thing, scientific things related with uh, pesticides, and also people from the different national organizations in member countries that can collaborate and work with the scientific advice for the Codex work. And finally, uh, of course, it's administrated by FAO and WHO, 
and it's one of the oldest scientific advisory body which gives support for Cortex. We have another scientific advisory bodies, as for example, JECFA, which gives support for uh, veterinary substances or additives, but uh, GMPR is one of the oldest scientific advisory bodies giving support for Codex. I, I, I mentioned uh, the importance of the priority list. This is a very key point uh, for the work of JMPR. Uh, it's very important that they receive exactly what is necessary to be done, take into account, firstly, human health, because this is the first and the most important pillar of the Codex Elementaris Commission, and also fair practice in food trade. When we have these two elements, we can analyze what member countries are uh, demanding and establish a, pri a priority list either of substances or commodities that can be also <coughs> take part of the list of commodities covered by one pesticide. So this uh, work developed by the JMPR is absolutely key to keep science as the basis of the decisions taken by the Codex Elementaris Commission. And to take this decision, sometimes the, the way is very long. You know, we have uh, eight different steps to, to have one molecular, for example, approved. But to me, it gives a lot of things that we have been discussing during this day today. For example, it's better to have this kind uh, of approach because we have more inclusiveness. We are talking about one structure which has 189 members, 188 member countries and one member organization which is the European Union. It gives uh, the possibility to, to digest, to better digest the scientific discussions. Sometimes it's necessary to go deeper in some discussion, scientific discussion. It gives also the possibility for some regions which, has, uh, so which have more difficult, for example, in terms of collecting data to present this data. So this long way, the eight steps the Codex has to have adopted one molecular, one substance, gives to us the necessary, I could say, time to have a better standard in, in a more balanced way for the membership. Exactly that. We have more balanced uh, results. So, uh, more than that, we are trying to construct, we are trying to build standards that uh, are not to substitute or to change the national legislation. The main importance uh, of the work of the national organizations is to, to strengthen harmonization, to harmonize uh, their legislation, take into account the Codex standards. So it's not a substitute of national legislation. They are voluntary in nature, but it's very important uh, to stimulate harmonization because, of course, uh, the main cell of the Codex work is the National Codex Committee. If the next National Codex <coughs> Committee from the different member countries uh, made a tremendous uh, effort to develop, uh, for example, information, data, etc., to participate in the meetings and to have, as a result, a standard developed uh, by the Codex, adopted by the Commission, it's important to have this standard harmonized in their own legislation. Sometimes 100%, sometimes 50%, but it's important to have this standard harmonized in their legislation. And also, as I already mentioned, the Codex is recognized by the WTO uh, as the uh, reference for food safety uh, issues and discussions within the WTO uh, the different pillars of the WTO. And finally, to give an example of a practical use of the standards uh, within one of the pillars of the WTO, which is the Standard and Trade Development Facility, STDF, we have three projects in different 
three regions of the world, in Asia, in Latin America, <coughs> and in Africa, where we have uh, the national authorities and a good public and private partnership in these different countries and regions uh, to, uh, uh, to adjust their legislation and their work uh, in order to attend uh, some requirements from international markets. Codex was used as the basis of the, of the work. Uh, we have a lot of efforts in terms of capacity building in the field and in laboratories to attend this demand of the countries. Of course, we have uh, to push a lot in these projects uh, the technical expertise in terms of generate, collect, and uh, interpret data. Uh, we have an increased uh, improvement in terms of the participation of these countries uh, related to the Codex MRL's definitions within the Codex work. A lot of collaboration from different organizations. And the countries involved were Ghana, Kenya, Senegal, Tanzania, and Uganda in Africa. The African Union was the organization which uh, pushed the project and implement the project. In Asia, we have the Asian Countries Association of the Southeast, Southeast Asian nations participating, and the Asian was the responsible to implement the project. And finally, Bolivia, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Panama, and AICA was the organization which has the responsibility to uh, implement the project. These are three good examples where we can use the codex standards to improve the use, the correct use of pesticides uh, when we are talking about crop production and human health and food safety, uh, following the science and trying to keep human health and fair practice in food trade. These are the points that I would like to exchange with you. Thank you. Right. Well, it's it's now lunchtime. But if you or give me give me a little bit of patience, we'll carry on for a bit because I've got a few questions for the panelists, and there are a few people here with questions. So I'm going to be I'm going to be selfish and start <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, primarily to Chris to start with. The um, we all have things in our career that we keep quiet, and I was once for seven years the editor of a magazine with agronomist in the title. And I used to go to every single crop protection product launch you, there ever was. And you reminded me of it when you were speaking. When you, start, you, you talked about how we've gone from, and this is how I think people normally describe it, one from a situation where the crop protection sector would provide you with a chemical and the chemical would eliminate this particular pest and once you had the chemical, the pest was eliminated or the disease was eliminated or whatever the problem was. And now when you talk to agronomists, um, you, you have this situation, you have whole cocktails of materials, you have, you have to start discussing percentage effectiveness and the onset of um, the onset of resistance. So, I mean, isn't isn't there something going wrong with how we're doing things in that we don't seem to be able to keep up, particularly with the resistance among pests, with in development terms with what we've got. We've got, oh no, if I'm really sort of blunt and cynical about it, we've ended up with quite a lot of products that basically don't work or only mm. work to a limited extent of effectiveness. And people do have to juggle them and do have to be very canny. And, you know, that doesn't, doesn't it sort of have the feeling of we should be trying a new direction at some stage? I, I would totally agree with everything you said. Um, we have moved out of that era where you can rely on that prescription to give you total control. Mm. Um, 
you know, if you look at some crops now, I can think of instances where, you know, we've rightly lost kind of, you know, say a broad spectrum in insecticide, you know, not a particularly nice chemistry by the regulatory standards now, mm. you know, because it may be decades old. Um, and that then gets replaced in producing that crop by, you know, you have something that's specifically targeted at uh, your caterpillar pest, something that's specifically targeted at your, your mite pest, something that's specific specifically targeted at your aphid pest. You're probably also using, you might be using some kind of pheromone mating disruption technology as well. It's this really complicated systems-based approach which then doesn't give you, you know, that control that you had before. And that, that is one of the challenges. Um, one of the other things, you know, coming back to this question about metrics and increasing pesticide use, I think you could quite simply see with that example how on the face of it, that is going to give you an impression that you are increasing your pesticide use. Because where you might have used previously one thing, that was very broad spectrum and basically it took out all insects, all your pests, um, and probably had an impact on your beneficials as well. You're using a much more broad-based, system-based approach of things that are much more specific. And part of that, the reason why they're specific is, I guess bluntly, they are far more benign than what um, we used previously. And that's a function of the way the EU regulation works. You know, that's, that's what it's kind of, you know, that's what it's doing, what it says on the tin. Its aim is to get rid of all that older chemistry. It imposes really very strict regu regulatory regime where only the benignest of things are able to, you know, get over the, uh, the finish line. John, do you want to add to that? Um, or just to, I mean, on this idea of new technology, um, which, of course, is not new for anybody outside Europe, for example, gene editing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, th I personally think it's disappointing that we had a European Court of Justice decision uh, to severely restrict gene editing within Europe. Um, for example, there is a potato being developed, which I'm sure we all know about, that could potentially reduce fungicide use on potato crops by 70%. Um, yeah, I would have thought that was a bit of a no-brainer, but it's a double whammy for Europe because not only is, well, do we not have access to that technology, but also the research and development is all going on outside the EU. The EU used to have, I think, 20% of EU of global research and development funding was in the EU, and that has drained away to about 7%. And partly it's because of the, the unpredictability of the regulatory regime. People aren't going to invest where they don't know whether they're going to have a product at the end of this system um, and of this very long, complicated progress, because right at the end of it, the science can be fine, the regulators can be right on board, and right at the end, somebody starts you know, a Twitter campaign or a social media campaign, and then you don't have that product. And so, all that technology. And I do think you know, that potential, we have fantastic scientists, scientists in this country and in the EU, and we're just missing out. That is now bleeding away to the other parts of the world that have a, a, a science and technology-based system. I think it, it comes back to this kind of mind the gap thing. I think that's a big concern for me and for my members. I don't believe that farmers and growers are wedded to the use of pesticides. Mm. What they want is an effective, effective. solution. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether it's a classical piece of chemistry. They don't care whether it's a biocontrol, a piece of cultural control, or putting in a predatory insect to kill another yeah. insect pest. What they need is effective solutions that are sustainable and economically sustainable for their businesses as well. And my concern is the rate at which we're losing current solutions, whatever they are, is far greater than we're seeing the alternatives, the replacements coming on board. And then we're left with a gap when we, where we can't produce, we won't be able to simply produce certain crops in the UK. We're facing a situation where it may soon be the case because of loss of insecticides or ability to control insect pests, we may see the loss of a flowering crop from within the UK arable rotation. And that will have damaging environmental impacts. That will mean that we are, you know, we won't have that flowering crop we will have a, a, a constant kind of grain cereal-based rotation, and that has impacts in terms of diversity and a whole range of things, and that's it's not good. So you want to add to that? Yeah, it's just um, going back to what I was saying about if you look at 
each problem that you have um, when it comes to pesticide use. Um, and you just look at it in that one kind of narrow picture um, and you try and come up with, like, so say, for example, the removal of a particular pesticide, what is a the farmer then going to do? It, it becomes really, really difficult uh, to come up with, with an alternative or um, a practice that can replace that. And that's why we go back to the fact that it, it, you do have to kind of look at the, the, for example, in that case, it would be looking at the whole farm. It would be looking at the, the health of the soils, the level of the wildlife. And it, 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 it could mean that you have to, for example, the very likely one is that you're going to have to have grow more crops, um, have a much more diverse crop rotation. So, for example, in the case of potatoes, uh, growing potatoes less often um, and bringing in some other crops in, or it, it, it does start, the, I think the most difficult thing is when it comes to this issue, unfortunately, the, the overall solution is not a simple, quick fix. It is changing the way that we farm. Um, and it does, the, the good thing is that it does solve lots of other problems as well. So. The, the, this is when I was referring to the bigger picture. Um, but just trying to solve each individual case where a pesticide is removed um, from a farmer's toolbox by just one simple replacement, it, it, it's not, I don't think long term that that's going to work like that. So it is about thinking bigger, about changing the way that we farm. But that does require a huge amount of support for farmers um, and recognition of public goods that farmers provide. And I think there's several people that want to ask a question. There's a lady here. Okay, yeah, I just suggest that we take two or three questions at once. All right. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I wanted to uh, thank you all for the quality of all these presentations. Um, coming back uh, to Louise's points earlier, um, I think there's something that we perhaps want to just clarify. Um, trade deals don't change import rules on maxima, maximum residue levels, right? Um, when you export a product, you're going to have to abide by the importer's rules with or without a trade deal. So I think that's a really important point to be made. And, and that comes back to the fair practices point um, that uh, uh, Guillermo Cost um, uh, brought up um, in his presentation. Uh, when we look at the EU's framework um, on, um, on crop protection um, and, and maximum residue levels, um, we see that many of the decisions to bring them down to what we call trace level, which is the 0 0.01 standard, um, are not based on uh, the protection of health. They're actually based on the commercial pipeline of companies that the only ones that can apply uh, for the application or the, reauthor the authorization or reauthorization of the products. And that's often based on a pipeline which is commercially valid here in Europe. What happens then is that it's not taking into consideration that the pests that we have in other parts of the world are not the ones that we have in Europe. So we might need some different solutions um, uh, when, we're, when we're using uh, crop protection products um, in, in exports. Um, and I was in Geneva uh, for the WTO uh, public forum. Uh, just a, a couple of days ago, a week ago, and um, I was asking, um, I was asking basically the WTO, how do they manage these issues? Because th these these questions about crop protection and the maximum residue levels, and particularly the EU regime, is now considered to be one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, sticking points, let's say, in international trade, in order to have a, a level playing field. Um, that allows for uh, food to circulate uh, in the world. And um, one of, one of the, the biggest um, critiques that we have here is the question of whether the regime is based on science. And I think that that was brought up um, on more than one occasion here by in multiple one of these um, presentations. Coming to my question uh, to you all, in the context of Brexit, is this an opportunity to perhaps bring back science into the debate and into the UK's regulatory regime, should it diverge from the EU? Right, and we to take another question. Yes. There's a gentleman at the front here who put his arm up. Do you still want to ask a question? Yeah. Well, um, I'll take the, the concept of the mind the gap that was used here in, since we're in the UK. It's a very British uh, expression. I think there is a gap between the need to increase food production because of 
global demand. And there is a gap which is reducing the use of chemicals, which are hammer, uh, uh, which are having negative impacts on ecosystems and ecosystem services. And then organic production is something which uh, can play an important role in that. But I'd like to invite you to, to think outside of the box. How can the crop uh, protection industry use less chemicals and more environmentally friendly uh, instruments to control pests and diseases? Uh, is there a way forward? How, how these new is, is, institutional design which is being presented here could be a part of this? Because currently we have a stress that has been pointed about by the biodiversity convention studies, the uh, um, uh, threat on extinction and, and loss of ecosystem services, which are very real. So how can we think outside of the box and, and increase production of food while reducing the impacts of chemicals in, in ecosystems? Oh, I think we should, yes. No, just take advantage of the, the, the two very good questions. Thank you very much for the questions, the last two ones. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, Chris said one very important thing, which uh, I think it's the beginning of it. When we're thinking about, for example, uh, food security and food safety, uh, what, what uh, what the producers really want. But uh, to, to answer that, uh, we need to, to take into account some elements. Firstly, uh, and I'm, I'm going to, to, your, to your question, the last question, how we can produce more. The producers would like to produce, of course, because they would like to have more space, trade space, etc., etc. But it should be done in a way that we keep production, keep the interest of the producers, keep food, sa uh, food security, but also guaranteeing food safety. There is no food security without food safety. Even if I have an, a, 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 enough amount of food, but we do not have uh, guaranteed food safety for this food, I cannot use it. Also, when we talk about trade, even if I have an enough amount of food, the food is saved, but I cannot trade this food from the production area to the consumption area due to some barriers, I will not have food security. So I think this kind of thing comes for one very basic element, in my point of view, it's commitment. Everybody is on board, the producer, the government, the international organizations, etc. So, science is one element that should be taken into account on this discussion, because we cannot uh, be far from it. Uh, and also commitment. Everybody is in the same in the same in the same boat. So uh, it's a, I could say a public and private partnership that should uh, be taken into account. Yes. Can I, have a, um, I think I think answers to the two questions quite linked, really. And for me, well, I, I have a research background. I started life as an entomologist, so it all comes back to the science in the end. But I, th I think you know we have to be making our policy on science and evidence. I hope that happens more, uh, and there's more opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. I know the regulator is very much up for that as we leave, as the UK is set to leave Europe. I mean, and. I'd like to think our regulator within Europe is often seen as a kind of pillar of scientific sense in a lot of the discussion. And I know for a fact that a lot of the other member states are very concerned about the UK leaving because it sees this scientific sense kind of walking out the door in committee meetings and the downward spiral may rapidly accelerate. But with respect to, um, you know, how can we use less chemicals? I th you know, it's got to be a science-based answer as well. And I don't think it's, it's simple. We need to look, we need to have a better understanding of what the actual impacts are. Because using less, you know, like 
I have a problem with the word chemicals for a start because I'm sitting here with four glasses full to the brim of chemical in front of me. Which chemicals exactly are you talking about? The solutions we might think that are immediately better might also have impacts. I was with some growers in Brussels yesterday, uh, Spanish growers who are up in arms that their um, government wasn't allowing them to use a, a predatory um, insect to control a, a citrus pest that, that's going out of control. And this is because the, their government is concerned about what well, its impacts on the wider environment. I guess it wasn't a native species. It could have impacts on different ecosystems. You know, everything has an impact that we need to factor in. But I think the solution has to come from having a very solid science and evidence base and being driven to look for systems-based approaches where we can low, lower our overall impact. So. Yeah, I mean, just to, to, to add to that, um, I mean, I think that... From what I see from our members, that's happening already. Um, as I said, it's not just synthetic chem chemistry anymore. One of our biggest groups as a member group is our biopesticides group, where two thirds of our members are involved very actively. We produce, I think, pretty much every single category of organic inputs um, our members are involved in creating. And um, there is always, I mean, the, the question of IPM, uh, the voluntary initiative, which as I said, is one of the programs we support is all about. IPM and that is but that's also about the looking at the impact the environmental impact so there is always probably five percent of a field that you could use that's not terribly productive you could probably take that out of production into wildlife banks beetle banks bird rich food mixes um, and not decrease the value of the the crop you know in, uh, keep the value of the same but take out the bit that's the, the least marginally uh, economically effective. There, there are, I mean, there's some amazing work that the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust does in this country, looking at, for example, they've had uh, a project looking at beetle banks, where if you place them in the right places, you only need to spray once in a year as opposed to 20 times because the beetles do the rest for you. They'll go right into the middle of the crop. So those are the sort of things that, this is what I, I'm trying to get across in my presentation, that in this country, I'm very encouraged because I think that's happening already. Um, there's always more to do, but I think those conversations and those breaking down of the barriers between I'm a conventional farmer, you're an organic farmer, you're a low-till farmer. That, certainly from the work I do with our young leaders, that doesn't seem to be the, the way the conversation goes at the moment. It's more about how do I manage my land effectively for future generations, for the environment, and also, to Chris's point, to make sure I still have a profitable farm. Because if you don't have a profitable farm, no one's going to be bothered about the environment. Just so just to no, it's just to complement. I'm so sorry, but because you said one very, very interesting thing in terms of young leaders, etc. Uh, well, I think uh, it's 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 a, it's a something related with change, and change is not easy, you know, because change usually takes us from from our comfortable zone. Uh, when we are talking about break of paradigms, it, it, it's not easy. There is one phrase which says that uh, only babies with wet, uh, wet pampers like change, because change is, is, is complicated. But when we are talking about food safety, uh, the primary responsibility is from that people who is producing. So they are producing. The, the, primary, production, the primary producer or the, 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 the industrial sector, they have the first responsibility to keep the food safe. So uh, it, it's directly related with the use of, of, of pesticides. Of course, each part of the, of the chain has the responsibility, the governmental area, the international organizations, etc., etc. But uh, we, we, we should take into account that uh, it's necessary sometimes to change the way uh, to think. Uh, it's important to produce, but I, I have the responsibility to keep the food safe because I'm offering the food for, for the people. Mm -hmm. Right, Louise. I'll, so I'll try and be quick because well, I guess well, the other well, 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 well,
Well, firstly, um, I just want to say there's an enormous amount of agreement, I would say, between what you're saying, which is quite interesting, because there are definite sticking points, we disagree, but I think it's important to realise how much we do agree. Um, and the second thing is that um, it, it's just coming quickly, very quickly back to the, the wildlife question, and that is, um, so, and it, it, again, it's, it's linking the two questions together. So, when I said about um, we want to see the same same level of regulation as, as the EU, that's um, so in the short term we, we want to basically see the same thing being applied. But in the long term, yes, there's definitely opportunity for the UK uh, regulatory system to, to be a bit different to the EU and better. Um, and the and it does come down to being science based approach. I think there's very very uh, broad level agreement on that. It's more about um, I think the sticking point is generally at what uh, level of proof, um, every, there's disagreement in terms of level of proof um, on, on safety issues. And, and that's, that, that's where it comes back to wildlife. So the EU is some of the, well, the highest level of pesticide regulations in the world, and yet we still have a wildlife problem. We can't prove uh, whether pesticides are a major factor in that. It's certainly not the only factor, that's, that's very clear. But, um, but there are bits of evidence that suggest that pesticides do play a large part, suggesting, therefore, that the EU regulatory system hasn't worked. Um, and the, the, t the two main examples that are normally used is, is the case of neonicotinoids, and the other one is um, the only study that I'm aware of in the world which has measured insect biomass over time. So this is flying biomass, which is the nature reserves in Germany. It's quite a well-known study because basically they've had a, a, a drastic reduction in the amount of flying insects in nature reserves. So the idea of setting aside wildlife areas, um, brilliant, and we should definitely be doing it, but there's obviously a problem there. And the researchers couldn't prove it, but they looked at various things, and, and pesticides seem to be the most likely reason behind that drastic decline. Um, so... In terms of the future, um, we, it, it, yeah, it just comes back to this fact that it's about working together and definitely, definitely being science-based, but it is this systems approach that we need to do. Um, so, for example, to replace a pesticide, a, an artificial pesticide product with, with an organic um, certified product, would, that, that, that's not the way forward to do that. Every, like, it's, it's not just about replacing a product with another product or... Um, or even using biological control. It, it really is this kind of systems approach. And so I just thought I'd leave it with the, the way that I've often seen it is what will, this is the UK countryside I'm talking about here, but what will the, what the, what will the countryside look like under the different scenarios? And I guess what we would like to see is a countryside that's going a bit more back to the patchwork that we used to have, so greater crop diversity, bringing animals back onto farmland, um, and bringing trees into farmland and it, the, the, the picture that you get of the countryside starts to change and it's that that we're trying to talk about and that's what we're trying to move towards um, and it's funny when you talk about pesticides you kind of forget about what, what is it you're trying to achieve what's it going to look like and it's this, this healthy system of farming this diverse system of farming um, and that's how you, you kind of you get past these issues that we're currently facing. Thanks. Right, we're about to be thrown out, aren't we? Yeah. Dinner, lunch is going cold. Good. Thank you very much. And thank you. Very thank much. you all.